Joey Pitts. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for having me. A fine Yankee welcome. <laughs> Boston Mass. Right, so, now, uh, the usual format is ask you a couple questions, and I'm sure the audience has several questions for you. Okay. So, we'll do it like that. Um, yeah. One thing I noticed though, when I was uh, of interest to uh, learn when I did some research um, regarding your career, um, before you uh, started your stage work, uh, you went to high school with a couple of well-known actors. Yeah. Two or yeah. three? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot, actually. A bunch, huh? My high school was like, uh, I am the oldest brat actor. Yeah. I got to see myself. Yeah, my friends in high school, Emilio Estevez, Sean Penn, Robert Downey Jr., Rob Lowe was in school with those us at the same time. But I mean, that was the time there was no Malibu High. I'm just turning this off, you guys. I know it's making noise. Um, so all the kids from all the Bob Dylan's kids, Flip Wilson's kid, Larry Hagman's kids, they all we all went to school together. So yeah, you're gonna know. Yeah. And it's funny because just talking about my friends makes me like the biggest name dropper ever. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, dude, that's just gonna. You know, it's real. It's real. You know, I just keep it real. Sure. Yeah. Did you graduate with him? Class? Amelia was in my class. Yeah. And in fact, um, Emilio and I became, he was probably my tightest buddy. He ran track. He was a pole vaulter. My brother was on the track team. And Emilio wanted to get into the family business. And I was already, quote, the actor. So my brother, like, brokered and us, introduced us. And then me and Emilio just became tight pals. And we would do, I had a forget the period it was, like, fifth period, just after lunch. I had that off. So we would meet in the library um, for an hour and read scripts. He was really into it. And then I actually drove him to his first audition. I remember driving him. He tells that story in the book he wrote, The Way, with that came out with his movie. Um, I tell the story about he, uh, me driving him to his very first audition to meet Alan Parker and audition for fame, and my mom's old Volvo. And, you know, that's cool. Just grow, that's one thing about growing up sort of in, in California. You have those experiences. You know, then obviously when I went to college, I met a whole met another group of kind of people that became very successful. You know? For sure. So um, this is more of a, almost more of a, a hobby for you and your friends rather than something you wanted to pursue while in high school? No, I mean, dude, I wanted to do it. Like, yeah, but I wasn't a pro. I mean, I knew I was getting up going to college. I wasn't, you know... I had a chew fro and I had big glasses. And I, I mean, I was an awkward looking sexy guy at the time. So, like, I knew actually I wanted to do it when I was eight or nine. I was in the Hebrew school play. I played David. I killed Goliath. I sang the song. I got the standing ovation. And I was totally hooked. Yeah. Well, except my dad, you know, my dad was like a, he was like a CIA kind of dude. And so he. He was like, I remember at the Hebrew school, there was an actor called Harold Gould. And Harold played like Rhoda's dad. And yes, was the he voice did. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a lot of great roles for Harold, a lot of great voiceover stuff. And so, of course, my dad, I'm eight years old, my dad's like, hey, you know, Hal, he's really interested. What do you think? Is he going to make it? Like, my dad at eight asking Harold Gould. And Harold's line was, well, he's going to have to grow into it. And I was like, I kind of got that. I said, well, that, that's not a no. It's not a no. Because obviously I had something in the performance, even my first performance, that he could tell I had. Because that's what happens when you're meant to do it. There's a, an ability to forget about yourself as a professional actor. That's what makes us all special. It's not really that we're all that freaking talented. And, you know, maybe some are. But the ability to forget about yourself and just think about the character. When I process the information about what the character's doing, that's different than me looking at it, oh my god, that makes me nervous. But I'm not actually doing that. The character's doing it. So I'm able to kind of suspend, I mean, and it can be something from like playing somebody that's nasty and evil, or maybe doing something that's like taking your clothes off, and you know, I did on TV or something like that, that's intimidating, unless you're going, well, Last time I checked, I shower naked, so I'm not going to say no to that piece of tape, no to that weird underwear. You know, and then they're like, oh, he's, he's ballsy. He's, he's gutsy. I know, I'm just, I'm an actor, I'm just doing my thing. But yeah, 
they get that reputation of having guts, but really what you're doing is just being true to the character. Interesting, yeah. That's a good wonder how many other actors see it that way. Oh, I doubt many, and that's why I'm one of the cool dudes. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what, I, I'm always gonna, I tell it the way it is. I don't bullshit it because it's like, listen, what's interesting is the actors, we're not, if the fans make the actor, okay? You guys, you guys define the art form. I'm not actually doing my art unless someone's watching me do it. So you must give respect to your audience as an actor because that it's the definition of what we're doing. We're in this, it's not just me. If it's just me talking, doing the lines, then I'm either insane or I'm on Bluetooth, right? So we need to have that. We have this important relationship. And you know that's why these particular shows, and that's why cons are fun for me. Because people always come up, hey, are you having fun? My answer is always, well, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't gonna have fun. Like I'm doing, I start, my karate, you karate. My karate teacher always says, make a fist, start like you mean to finish. Like I don't make a wimpy little fist, I'm gonna hit you with a tight ball. And I'm starting, I'm starting my fist is balled up already before it's coming at your head. So that's my acting style too. I mean, I'm coming hard, you know? I'm gonna bring everything I got. You know, it's all I got in life is attitude and effort. So I try hard with a smile on my face, and then I, I don't care. Would that be considered a type of school of method acting? I, my school is the whatever works. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. the whatever works. Because sometimes you do need, do need to invest emotionally to, to find the sincerity of it. Um, I think what the real challenge, what the exciting actor does is he's emotionally vulnerable when they call action. He's available. My best work, the best work that I respond to, that I'm aspiring to, but what do we see in the, in the legends? What do we see in Javier Bardem? What do we see in these people that I go, oh, I like the way he works, you know? They're vulnerable. There's something going on. His mouth says one thing and the eyes are saying something different. And that's the movie actor. That's, that's the essence of it. To be able to say one thing with your eyes when your mouth is saying something else in the dialogue. To create that little bit of a twist on it. It's an emotional twist. If you're playing a badass, some bad guy, and he's, say he's a mass murderer. Say he's a, a child abuser. What, it's way scarier, way scarier if the guy's beating the kid going, it's for your own good. I'm going to be able to lock you in this closet because you need it. That's way scarier than, oh, God, I'm just evil. It's way darker. So you, any bad guy, doesn't he's, he's going he's to be thinking he's doing you a favor. I'm, an, I'm sorry I have to shoot you right now, but it's for the best. It's a way more interesting choice. So, you know, and then, so whatever works, right? I mean, a lot of times I can just jump into it. I mean, a lot of times I'm just, I can get into, like, my side phone character. That was me. I have parking issues. <laughs> I'm really doing it for real. I'm really bad parking issues. So, like, you know, that was not acting. That's not acting required. Don't ever get caught doing it. That's the thing about acting. It's something you don't want to get caught doing, right? So, no, no, bad parking. No, I'm an excellent partner. But, uh, <laughs> You know, it's just that uh, it was, you know, it's the irony of getting that role and then, you know, my family laughing at me. They knew the truth. It was insane, you know. So. So I, I can imagine that technique and style lends itself well for stage work, too. Mm. That's when you really. Well, stage is, you know, stage is, I don't, I love stage. I do. But I way prefer film than TV. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because, number one, way more people see your work. Sure. Um, and the stage, I like my art to be totalitarian. Theater tends to be super democratic sometimes, and I'm like, ah, oh, somebody just, I don't want to hear everyone talk about what their feelings are. I, I like it to, let's, move, let's move it along. I got, I got things to do, you know what I mean? And film, you know, film and TV, we, we're capturing the moment. I can, so I remember seeing, say, from Pirates, um, not just for the dialogue and what happened in the scene, but for what I had for lunch, where I was on the water, or the, image of this, the, you know, I, the, the memories come back not just as what the work was, but as like everything behind the scenes, right? So the fact is that that's the day we're shooting this scene. We have to get it. You have to be on. You have no choice. It's four in the morning, man. I'm on the set of Once Upon a Time. And it's four in the morning. That's when I'm getting my close-up. 
You're almost guaranteed it. So, what am I going to do? I'm tired, man. No, it doesn't work like that. you got to be ready to go. And so that is what really appeals to me about, about this. I love sports, right? So the great analogy is, I mean, Ted Williams. I don't know, split his split or what did he, a lifetime batting average, I believe, 341, whatever it was, right? Dude wouldn't make it as an actor with that batting average. No shot, you got about a thousand. You got about a thousand, you got to always hit it. You got no choice. There's another dude that can hit it hard. That's why in sitcoms, man, you got to make every, you got to hit every laugh. Or it's a bad joke and they'll rewrite it. But if you can't hit that, and every one, you have, it's like, this is a thousand, you have to bat a thousand in our business. Do you feel pressure? Nah, it's fun. I mean, I don't even think about it. I know I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, sure. And then there's a director, there's people that help me. Yeah. I don't ever have to remember my lines. I guarantee I've never gotten one part in this business because I got all my lines right. Ever. It's always, it's always how you're saying, not what you're saying. So I never, like, why that line schmeiss? I'm never. I'm going to get them word perfect. I certainly am. Absolutely, every word perfect. Because you owe that to the writer. You owe that to that person too. That, that it doesn't say writer by your name. Why are you paraphrasing? You know this guy. He, he spent hours doing it. I, I mean, actors do that. I can't say that. Well, why not? Sometimes that weird syntax is is like what makes it challenging. Jane Espenson on once she writes wild syntax. I mean, the, the, her lines are like, whoa, that's a mouthful. Right? But spit it out, practice it, do your homework. Anthony um, Hopkins, I read this cool thing he wrote one time. He goes, um, I say my lines aloud 200 times in my hotel room before I go on set. Aloud. I was like, oh, my, that's great, that's a great note. I'll try it. I get up to like 25, that's awesome. <laughs> 200 times. But then you can understand how he's like, oh, done it so many times. He's done it so many times. He's not thinking of the words. He's done it. He knows the words. Because he's, he's, he's talking, he's going, he's the one step further. It's the how he's saying it. So then he's able to play with it. He's able to go, oh, God, whatever it is. Oh, no, Carrie, stop. You're so delish. Whatever it is. He's, he's done the permutations of it. Correct. You know, the tongue thing and the whole thing. Like, oh, God's kind of done it. Like, oh, good. You're not just discovering that. Right? Um, so, like, if you were to break down how I do it, it would be whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Ninety-nine percent of the time, I'm just me. Because it's actually like some. I mean, I catch myself like as a from. I hate watching myself sometimes because I'm just like, dude, you just overcooked the shit out of that. You know? <laughs> because you got to learn subtlety. You know, like I'm like. Some of the sitcom and the stuff I pay for, like just making big faces and all this comedy, like tails of the crack. Oh, I'm gonna, ah, you know. It's like that doesn't sell that. That doesn't sell. That's not what they want. They won't buy that. You know. So sometimes they'll say, "Oh, he's too big. He's too big." You just have to let the other actors' ideas and choices hit you and affect you. So sometimes, like when I'm bad, I don't let that happen. So that's why I take class. I study. I mean. That's the, the, the key is just never figure like you've ever made it. Just keep cranking, I'm still in class, I still work with young actors, it keeps me young, it keeps me hungry. You know, hang with somebody who really wants it like you used to want it, you know? It's like cigarettes, right? This buddy of mine is a Cirque du Soleil, now he's a personal trainer, my buddy's in Vancouver, and I would smoke cigarettes, and then he's like, you don't want to quit. And I was like, oh. You know, it's just hard. He goes, no, if you wanted it like you want your acting career, be like that. Put them down that day, it was done. In one second. Because mentally I was like, oh, you're so right. If I just want to try, I mean, look at that. Yeah. I mean, I, the thing is, quitting, I don't believe in quitting. A quitter never wins and a winner never quits. So God forbid I'm at the bar and I have a few shots and I want to have a cigarette. I'm going to have it. That doesn't mean I'm going to go buy a pack and go smoke. Because I want one. I'm going to have it. I'm not giving in, I'm not breaking, I'm not, no. So, quitting is the dumbest thing you could ever do. Anything. You're setting yourself up to fail. Learn how to control the impulse. Learn how to control it. That's a way more powerful thing. You know what? Anything. Anything. I never did heroin, but I have plenty of friends that did. No, super, super popular. Something super popular. Something but I grew up in the 80s. I mean, yeah. partying was like, that was how we rolled. Mm. That was how you were cool, you know? It wasn't very cool to not be like you know in the hip crowd. You, know? you mentioned uh, pirates. A couple of things mm -hmm. spring to mind that um, stand out for me. 
one to the other, that line you deliver with, uh, I think the fellow he's, he's um, the British actor would be the wooden eye. Or Mackenzie Crook, who yeah, was on the British office. Yeah, the office right. Uh, now, was he, is that an uncle-nephew relationship? That was because I didn't want it to be, the only obvious right. relationship was that we were gay lovers. <laughs> <laughs> and, I was like, and I just, and not, that I, not that I didn't have a problem that's, with that, but I just was like, you know what, yeah. that's, that's too simple of a way to just justify why these two guys have that kind of like sure. symbiotic relationship. So I was like, what makes sense? Well, what makes sense is that he's my sister's kid. Yeah. You know, and then I, that, that would give us an age a yeah. little older. It would explain yeah. why we're so tight. Exactly. You know, and that's that's what we love with. Yeah, so I was Uncle Abner. And he was like, yeah, because we can make up names. Yeah. I mean, they never actually say our names until no. like the third movie. Uh -huh. Pintel and Regan, right? Yes, yes. So, yeah, it was Abner Pintel, Uncle Abner. That sounds like a total pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> But that was just our backstory. You know, like we've been happy. Yeah, yeah. I'm staying at Gladner's house. <laughs> but I was given the assignment to become his best friend. See, he was cast first. That was the thing. All the guys, there's only a few Americans in the movie Johnny, myself. Um, and so they had cast all the English guys first. So I would say, like, the greatest break I ever got in this business was they couldn't find short ball and crazy in London. Because <laughs> that gave me a chance, because Americans don't get a chance to put on accents. Like, we, there's, we, I guess we suck or something. <laughs> but very rare. You, you tell me the amount of times that, like, they trust American character actors to go to that side of the pond. You know? So I found myself with an opportunity. I had a Juilliard dialect coach. Everyone else is English. No one's going to need to work with you, dude. So suddenly I'm available. Again, I've also just recently heard that Anthony Hopkins thing, right? Yeah, about the 200 times allowed. So here I am having to do a dialect, knowing that's the only way I'm getting fired off this movie is my dialect sucks when I come to that table reading if it doesn't sound like I'm from over there. So I just did the work. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I, did, I don't... I, I don't, I'm not afraid of the work, you know. When you deliver that line, the, when uh, Depp's, <coughs> excuse me, I forgot what happened to uh, Jack Sparrow, but he's out of it, <coughs> as usual. But um, he was trying to say, pronounce parlay. Oh, parlay, yeah. And he, he couldn't, he kept just pronouncing it, and the nephew said, parlay, and then uh, yeah. your response. My, my response was, damn to the depths, whatever Muttonhead thought of parlay. <laughs> when he said parlay. Yeah, and then, but this is the fun thing, because that led to one of the great outtakes of it, when he goes, we started improv because Gordas kept rolling. So that was funny. So it's like, because Johnny goes, that would be the French. And then there was that was when he goes, um, then he says like something about mayonnaise. And I'm like, I'm not mayonnaise. <laughs> and then for wherever I would go, I'd get like two signings and I'd get jars of mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> really don't actually. I mean, a little dabble, do you? I wasn't a lot of like, fry. But I mean, something else, like, I was like, best foods or something. I am like an ad for that, you know? Yeah. Before, one of the other thing was, um, there's no take, excuse me, it's uh, you and Johnny Depp, and uh, you, you're, you're on around him, and you're going off about something, and he's just, you know, just taking it all in, and you're just overpowering him completely, so it was an outtake, it was... Uh, well, that was, I think that's what you're talking about is in my, um, I did also that Diary of a Pirate, Maybe. so I made my own movie where Disney had gave me a camera, and I was the only person on the okay, movie allowed to have a camera on set, yeah. and, but I was going to do sort of a new documentary about it. So, because they knew what they really wanted is Johnny in the action kit, and they knew I could get the access to him. They couldn't get their electronic press kit anywhere near him, but with my camera, I could. So I just chose my moment, and then it turned out to be a little bit of cinematic history because he was into it, and then he's a he's a sweet dude. I mean, he's he's like he's a he's a he's a legitimate superstar, and and a, um, but he's he's a kind dude. He's like a real person. I mean, he's like, he's, he's introspective, he's intelligent, he's caring, he saves his bullets for producers. He never wastes a bullet on someone that's weaker in status. And in fact, if anything, he like, he elevates the whole game because he remembers content to conversation. He remembers like, if a question comes up and it can't be answered, two days later he's like, I found out the answer to that question, you know? So, I mean, he's a, he's a good dude. And I, I back his play usually, you know, pretty hard, you know? Yeah. All right. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'd say. How difficult is the script on once? I mean, with the, the jump and continuity, and I mean, what did they give you originally? Just a script like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, the scripts are fantastic. As an actor, how do you how do you deal with that? 
Uh, you know what you do is you kind of take each, like you just break it apart. And so you know like, okay, if, like say for example, when it's like my story and I actually get to carry the ball. Because not frequently I'm just in there doing function like town crier, I scream a lot, I'm an excellent yeller, and, um, and I say sarcastic things. So that's fairly easy for me. But when I have to carry any kind of dramatic thing, you just chart it. So you pull out all your stuff that happens, say, in the fairy tale world when I meet the fairy and I'm young and I'm first born. And that episode of Dreamy was a perfect example because you had to kind of track it. The arc of the two stories, okay? So you just pull it apart and look at all your fairy tale stuff. And then, okay, this follows that, this leads to that, this scene yeah. follows that. Yeah. And then when you're in the town, you do a similar thing with the arc. And then you look how it all fits together. Because sometimes what will happen on the show wow. is the way you, they call them transitions, but the way you transition from the end of one scene into the other is, like there's a famous one a couple seasons ago where uh, Regina goes, or uh, I think maybe J-Mo goes, I know just who to tell. Like, who, we want this word to get out, about this, that, you know, who's the evil person. So I know just how to tell them, the next thing I pop in, terrible news! So the way they cut it, you know that that's, that they made me fall for, for, for it. Okay, um, they're brilliant writers. Yeah. I mean, if anything, it's more of like, holy fuck, that's cool. <laughs> Red's the wolf, whoa, you know? And that's brilliant. See, what the thing is, is like, that's what happened with pirates too, is good writing is always the key. I guarantee it. I'm, I have a shot when the writing's good. I don't have a shot when it's bad writing. I mean, I'm not that talented to, to elevate the material beyond a little bit. Okay, so the writing, that's why the play is the thing. But what they do to an audience, for, for once and for pirates, is they say, hey, these are the stories that you love. And we are not going to change the fundamental truth that you already know about the ride at Disneyland or Disney World. We're going to build into our world, in fact, homages to that. Uh, Gibbs is laying with the pigs. The dog has the keys. You hear the music. Uh, Jeff uh, Barbosa says, like, dead men tell me, whatever it is, the lines that you'll hear on the right. Saying to the audience, this is your pirates that we're just borrowing it. So come, come with us as we tell this new story. And that's what the boys did on once. They took those fairy tale characters, they didn't change it. They didn't, they didn't, they left the, the A and the Z and just changed the B, C, D, E. <laughs> And that way, we all can relate, and we all can go, oh, those are still our characters. You feel ownership. And that's smart. Writing is, it's, it, you know, they don't get a lot of credit, necessarily, in our town, uh, because they're, like, tend to be nerdy, you know, but they are they're the straw that stirs it all. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, what's it like on once as opposed to, I mean, let's say a lot of your sets are digital on once, whereas in Pirates of Sea there are so many physical detailed sets. What's the, what's like, um, the difference in that? There's no difference. There's no, I mean, I mean the, the, the thing is, Jerry Bruckheimer's a badass dude, <laughs> right? So the way Jerry makes a movie is, he's like golden age filmmaker. He's like, all right, we're, we're shooting a pirate movie, so we're going to go to the Caribbean and we're going to put you 20 miles out to sea on a pirate ship. So you don't, and you're, you're not, you don't have to act in a Jerry movie, because you're going to live it, you're going to experience it. You're going to be on a white sand beach that's only pops up two months a year out of the ocean. You're going to be on a real ship, you're going to see, you know, they give you a lot of information. Once upon a time, we do have a lot of practical sets, but we do a lot on the Zeus system. This has a lot to do with how computers have changed filming, right? And Pirates has a lot to do with that, because when we did the first Pirates, um, the, and the skeletal animated pirates were, it was kind of like a layered animated technique where I'm going to wear my dress and for example, I'm fighting the dudes in the dress, okay, but I'm a skeleton because the moon's out. So we're fighting, we sh so we shoot that sword fight ten dudes. Then I step out and the stuntmen do it all by themselves, the same moves. Then everyone steps out and they shoot a clean plate of it. And then they had this thing they called it the dingus. And the dingus would come in, and the dingus was this orb, and, an orb, and kind of ball thing that would capture the way all the lights would. And that's when they fed into the computer to be able to imitate what the lighting would be. 
And then they would animate that from that, okay? By the time the second movie had come out, computers had advanced far enough that the bad guys were in mocap suits and able to move and you know be rendered in full light, right? So my head one. That's my five minute warning. I'm talking too long on this question. Boring. Um, but the computers have advanced. Now all filmmaking is digital. Okay, so where on Once Upon a Time, we have what's known as the Zeus system, which was Jim Cameron's invention. And essentially what happens is we're on a gridded green screen stage <clears throat> with a few practical pieces of, of furniture, um, just a few. And, but the camera shoots it. And then it's automatically fed in through the computer. And then on the monitor at, the, at where the DP is, comes a fully rendered image of what it's going to look like. The director of photography. So he'll have his own little hut where he's watching the images and watching it where the gaffer does the lighting is sitting. And they're kind of watching all the images as opposed to the director's little hut. Mm -hmm. He has a separate hut. But the director doesn't have that. Only the DP has it. So you can actually go and see exactly what it's going to look like the green screen stage. So there's a lot of information that you can put in. But nobody's, nobody's as badass as Jerry Bruckheimer. I used to say that if Jerry shot 300, we would have shot him in Thermopylae. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> he would have gone there, he would have dug in and excavated, he would have found, found real, real versions. He, he doesn't mess around. And, and that's why he's a legend. You know, in my humble opinion, he makes movies he wants to watch. So whether you like him or not, he's made it. And then money usually is the marquee of you know, how successful we are in this business, unfortunately. Yeah, it's true. Um, what is one of the funniest moments that you can remember while filming once? Oh, wow, man, we laughed all the time. I have this character, I think, I had this acting coach character, like I'm Josh's acting coach on set. That tends to get pretty funny sometimes. Because my acting coach is very silly guy. And I'm Josh, it's all about working from the thighs. I just, I'm talking shit like the whole day long. Because it's a lot, it's hard, it's wet, it's cold, it's whatever it is out there. So um, we laugh all day long. You know what I mean? That's how we do it. You know? And everybody's in on it. You know? So I would think that's pretty much a daily occurrence. I'm trying to think if there's one thing that was. Not really, not a I don't like practical jokes because I don't want them pulled on me. Because I'll never <laughs> pull them on you. Because um, I don't respond too well to them. So I don't like being embarrassed. It's really one of the few things that gets me, could get me pretty ornery. And, like people, like don't, as long as you don't mistake my kindness for weakness, I'm never going to have a problem with you. But like I say this like when I walk my dog, sometimes people will be like, hey, does your dog bite? And I'm like, well, gives a shit about the dog, he's got a pit bull for an owner. <laughs> and that's the truth. You know, like, if you don't, if you, if I give respect to get it, but if you give me, I'm going to give you back what you give me in spades, you know? So, um, I stay away from the practical jokes, and, but I think the most, once is probably one of the most fun places you could ever work, because we love each other. I mean, as family, it's like you're all, we're all away from home. We're all living in Vancouver. It's all we're all like, you know, a way we had to form something together. And luckily, you know, the the number one star of our show, Jennifer, is she's one of the greats. She's one of the nice people. Whoever your number one actor is, their behavior dictates how the rest of us get to behave. If number one's a douchebag, yeah, I can be a douche. So he's gonna get away with it. Like, I mean, if it's David Boreanaz or whatever, like the dude from uh, Bones and Alien. I mean, the dude was dick. <laughs> I, work with I mean, there's very few dicks in this business, and I'd be like, dude, you, even if he's the nicest guy now, I'm saying, that day you worked with me, you left me the impression that you were just the biggest fucking douche. <laughs> Literally, making everyone wait, his trailer's right there. I mean, he might have had a bad day, I should probably be saying this. No, I mean, between me and my next closest friends, you know. But that behavior resonates with me, I never forgot it. I never forgot Kate Jackson being too busy for her off-camera when I did Baby Boom years ago. Like, where, the, where are you going? What's so important in your Porsche that you got to split? Like, we did all your coverage, now I'm going to look like shit because you're gone, I'm going to read the script super. Andy Griffith, I can understand, he's drunk at my lunch. <laughs> God bless him, great guy. He was drunk as shit by, by noon. So Matlock, I mean, no one, no one got to do a close-up with him. No one. 
He was done. He had to shoot all his first yeah. because he was done by me. You know, it's yeah. it. You know? But I'm not going to ever, but he's a legend in the business, and he was a nice guy about it. You know, so, you know, everything's not a secret. He was old, you know, for a long time. You know, battled alcohol for a long time. But, you know, somebody that kind of, to me, like, I'm never going to forget that behavior. So, you know. Always be nice. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. But it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> How much advantage do you think that you're going to have from the scripts? Do you know, like, are you, How much advance do you get the scripts? No, how much of you is do you know that you're going to shoot so many episodes per year or do Yeah, at the beginning of the year they'll sort of give me like a guarantee of how many minimum that they'll at least have to pay me for, even if they don't use me. <laughs> um, that's been the last couple of years. I mean the first couple of years I had no clue. You know, so we just were sort of going by the seat of their pants. So I might have as much as as little as no notice and as much as a week or two notice that I'm gonna be going up to work on the show. But I'm basically, you know, I think I've flown 70,000 miles this year already, so it was a good year for my frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yeah, I live on planes. But uh, you know what, though? I, I don't mind it, because I can't make that work isn't happening in LA. There's, the jobs aren't there, so, like, it's easy for me to explain that to my family. My family understands that. I've got to go. I've got to make a buck, biz. Like, that's like, as long as you bring home the bacon. You know, but a lot of people work way harder than me. I mean, let's let's be honest. We have real heroes in this country that don't get the respect, and that's just about everyone that isn't a professional actor. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the bottom line. When the garbage man, the garbage man is more important than the actor. You know why? Because actors don't like to pick shit up. <laughs> this would be a dirty world, right? I mean, teachers that inspire, nurses and doctors, these people that are first, you know, the people that are on the front line. My brother's a rocket scientist. I mean, God, this stuff's way more interesting. Like, oh, I'm going to put a rocket in geosynchronous orbit, and we're going to go look for the origin of life. I'm saying maybe that's more important than an episode of Once Upon a Time. But I'm not sure. <laughs> to the fans, not necessarily. But I'm just talking in the overall import of our, our deal. What happened is, though, this is a good one. You'll like this is a good lesson. Way back in ancient time, you know, the art of acting was a sacred event. In ancient Greece, and you know, back in the old days, I don't know if anyone's ever been to those old theaters, the theater of Epidaurus, where acoustics was invented and discovered, right? The science of it. Well, the church came into business. Then suddenly, the telling of stories is only the business of the church, so the actor, this is straight out of like the engineer, basically, actors became vilified. And for all the way through the Dark Ages, there was no dog, and all the way up, an actor shot Lincoln. All the way up until the modern age was no dogs or actors allowed. <laughs> then the TV and the, then the movie got invented. And then holy shit, suddenly that screen, whatever, in there, more powerful than the written than the spoken word. A way more powerful way to convey emotion. So what happened? Suddenly the went, which actors were so important then? Because here we are again doing a sacred thing. But the problem is now you got a this cult of personality, you gotta deal with your you got to deal with your Kim Kardashian.